Hola, hola. Ah. Buenas. Well, uh, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> We're going to talk to each other. I've been having, uh, I've dreamt uh, all night about this moment. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you everything we did in the dream. Yes. So, uh, Federico Guillermo, you know, and uh, my dad was Federico and my brother is Federico. Okay. See? Wow. See? So I know that name. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it's, it's one of the hardest things. Well, I, I was of the very, hard I, I hurdles was very curious uh, to talk to you about your beginnings because we have some similar stuff in the sense that you you uh, were you had a formation as BFX too, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Talk to me about that. I, I started. I think when I was seven, I started doing like uh, stop motion with VHS with little toys. Uh, that led to when I was in my 15s, I was doing short movies, like superhero stuff in the streets of Montevideo with a cape myself acting on the shorts, like all that super A, like, but not film. I never got to, you know, this is mid 90s. So it was all VHS. So by the time, I, you know, if you cut to 2000. Six two thousand seven. I've been doing it for a long time, right? Well, one of your shorts. Yeah, yeah. And I did, a, I did a short, yeah, called Panic Attack back in Uruguay, with no money because I did all the visual effects myself, everything. Did you see that short? Anyone here? Yeah, great. And the short, and, and, and you know, I, and I did just for the sake of doing it, really, because I I love the craft of filmmaking so much, and I and I learned every aspect of it, just because to see it on the screen for me and. I finished it, I dumped it on, on YouTube and I went to bed and then I woke up and it was like Hollywood telling me, you gotta come here. And I had 150 emails from this town and, and they flew, someone flew me here. And never, this is what year? This is 2009. This is the end of 2009. 2009. December so 2009. Yeah. 14 years ago. Yeah. And great. you just finished Alien. You know, I'm doing Alien. <laughs> yeah, it's quite, it's quite. I was actually staying. This is a, we were telling my wife that we were just dating back then and we're just going around here. And the, 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 and the apartment's right across the street. That's why they put us up, me and Rodolfo, my co writer, to start thinking about our first movie back then. And I was like, oh, wow, it feels like ages ago. But yeah. 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 It I'm is. Like yeah, it is. It is. It is <laughs> ages ago. So, so then, then, then what happens? What, between that and your first feature, what happens? Well, you know, because that was kind of a, it, we, we were happy in Uruguay doing our things. We didn't, we were never aiming to come to Hollywood because it had never happened. Me neither. Yeah, no, exactly. When particularly, I mean, we were got a hire from Montevideo. Statistically, it, it had never happened before. So it's not something you, you say, you tell people, I want to be a director, I want to work in Hollywood. Even if I desired it, it was like, I don't even gonna say it to myself because it's like, the same saying, not being an astronaut, it never happened, so it wasn't going to happen. So it was just, and there was, I think that was a great thing, you know. I, I, that's always when we talk about the Latino experience. I mean, when that prize is not in your mind and you focus on what matters, which is the things that is for you and you like, I think that really helped me. And we, so we did that. We did a short, the short g gave us a deal to make a first movie with Sam Raimi, which is a big fan of him. So we met Sam. Sam was like, I want to help you to make your first movie. And at the time, we, we thought, you know... Great guy and great gardener. Lovely guy. And a great, he's, great. he's very good in his good, garden. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Great cook as he well. He fertilizes with blood and bones. I'm not joking. I'm not <laughs> joking. It's true. <laughs> it's a good, a dear friend of mine. And, and so, basically, at the time, they say, okay, let's hire a writer. You know, you, you need to come up with a story. And we have, we have great writers here in town. And, and we hire someone to write this story. And I was like, that's great. So I brought my friend Rodolfo Sosaez from Uruguay. And so I was like, okay, we're going to make movies here. He came here. Uh, we, we wrote on the story. And then we hired a writer. And then we waited, we waited a few months. And then that, writer, that script came in. The script came in. It just it was not a movie, which I was shocked because from where I was sitting, because, you know, writers at that level get paid quite some money. I was like, this is shocking that it's not a movie. And I'm not, you know, the writer was a good writer, but that was people were used to it. You deliver a script, it's 120 pages and some ideas. And I was so shocked. I remember calling the studio when I got the script and I'm like, this is terrible, this is not a movie. And, and everybody, my team around me was like, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to say, this is great. <laughs> So, no, so that, it gets that, made. That, that's, so it great, gets, that's great that you did that. No, of course. I was like, what am I talking about? We're not, but everybody, the logic is you made it here. You got a window to make your first film. You got to do it. And I did completely opposite. We said like, there's no way I'm making this. It's not a movie. And then everything, as you know, in like, I think in one month or two after being like, everybody was like, he's the next Spielberg. 
no one will remember who I was. Two months later, I bump into someone here. I was like, oh, the short, yeah, sure. So we're left to our own devices. And, uh, and we heard that Sam Raimi had said to someone on a hallway when he knew about the tragedy of Fede that came and, and that movie died very quickly. Well, maybe maybe Fede for Evil Dead, what do you think? And someone was like, maybe, because they were trying to find a filmmaker for Evil Dead. We heard that with Roto. This is another very Uruguayan thing that I think about now back. I was like, we're out of our minds. We just were like, oh, Evil Dead, fucking great. We love Evil Dead. I had my, and I had a very clear emotional memory of watching that movie for the first time, which I think is very important to make them just really tap into what I felt while I was watching it, not what it's about, not what it, yeah, no, yeah. just like what was my core feeling watching it and try to, with my eyes closed, reproduce that, right? Like and just you, like I repaint you, what you I did. memory you did. of when I was 12 years old. And, uh, and, so and how I was old are you movie. now? I'm 45. Oh, shit. I know I don't look, <laughs> I look I, younger. I'm 58, so 50, <laughs> 59 you. Monday, guys. 59 Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, two things. Uh, I'll tell you a little story and then I'll ask you another thing okay. because uh, when I first came to the States, I came because I owed a shitload of money from Kronos. I owed a quarter of a million dollars personally and I was 28 and, and they said, do you want to take meetings in Hollywood? I go, fuck yeah. You know? <laughs> and I go, and my first meeting was at Fox, uh, at Universal One and then Fox and my agent says, you're going to go and pitch for the fly to and I go in and, and I, I get in and they says so we're making the flight too what do you think I, go, I said I think you shouldn't make it <laughs> this is why this is why because the first one's great and my they call my agent I think he's <laughs> mentally damaged <laughs> I that was my my first meeting it was not very good uh, and my meeting at Universal before that was with an executive called Sam Devine and she said, we want, what would you think about remaking Kronos in English? I said, no. So it was a successful week. <laughs> and, and back then, to me, what was great about coming to Hollywood is that they paid my room service. So I, I would order a large burger with cheese and fries. And I would say, this is the best job in the world. <laughs> now, anyway, uh, but... What I like about your trajectory, I love it, and we can talk more about it, is you, uh, for me, the best producer is a director. Uh, because you understand the rule, which is produce the way you would like to be produced. Yeah, yeah. And, and you were, I would say, blessed enough in where you are now with Ridley Scott and where you started with Sam Raimi in your career in the States to be produced by directors. And I think... Uh, that's that's really phenomenal. Your relationship is with two directors that I would imagine you admired as absolutely, a kid. Absolutely, absolutely. It was a dream to sit down because just like today, my dream has always been when when I when I as soon as I landed here, understanding all those masters, I was like, they're driving around and this they're they're there. <laughs> they validate their tickets. Yeah, they they exist. They're both they became human beings. You yeah, know? well, it's they, like they, 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 everybody before is. that it was like a legend that I, and once I was here, I understand they were human beings and I met Sam and, yeah. and that made me understand that Especially maybe I Sam. Movies. He's very Sam. humble. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so. No, I when we started doing the we started doing a thing called the we, we used to do dinners with George Cam, John Carpenter, Joe Dante. Uh, um, David Cronenberg, when, when he was in town, and we started, I, there was a table that had, had a birthday, and we went and sang Happy Birthday. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, the masters of horror sang Happy Birthday. And we started doing that joke, and then when we went out, <laughs> they divided the fucking bill. And I was saying, let's see how much the masters of horror tip. And then we were outside and said, let's see what the Masters of Horror are driving now. And, <laughs> and it stayed, and it became a TV series and all that. But yeah, every, look, the thing is, we do something really special, but we are basically specialized idiots. <laughs> we, 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 we are not above anyone. We are mostly below social function, and we're lucky enough, if there was no movies, we would be thrown out of a fucking cliff when we're born. <laughs> you know? So I, I think it, it, we are human beings, and that's, that's one thing that this town can make you forget. And success is the most vile poison. There are two things that are poisonous, success and wanting success. Yeah. 
Those are pure poison. And I think, uh, and I think I want to ask you, because uh, when you did Evil Dead, it was successful. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you how, because then you follow up with Don't Breathe? Yeah, well, that's, yeah, when I, basically Evil Dead comes out, we write it, that was the, the punchline of the whole script was that Sam Raimi was, trust us enough to say, because when, when Evil Dead came about, we call him out of the blue, we pitch him the movie, he was like, yeah, sure. It was like, but can we write it? Because we're going to fuck it up, rather fuck it up myself. And, and everybody else would have said it's an insane idea. We, we barely <laughs> spoke the language back then. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, but Sam was like, you're a great storyteller, that's what matters. That's the only thing that matters. You just, you just go, I, I trust you. Yeah, and, and, and it let us do it. And thank God it did, because that it started, you know. So we wrote the movie, the movie comes out, you know. We, we never expect that it was going to be what it was going to be, mostly because the process of making it is always kind of, I don't know for you, but for me it's like, whatever I imagined it, the movie was going to be on, on the last day, it was like, <laughs> and I thought it was going to be good. And I thought it was going to be this whole thing that now it's just, well, but I still loved it. And, and it came out, did great. Um, and then it comes to all the, all the offers of the big studio stuff. How many like, years between Evil Dead and Don't Breathe? Three years. Yeah. Three years. Yeah. Any other developing? Did, they, did you develop? I don't. I didn't want to develop. I didn't want to get attached. I think we did a bit of that for a minute, and then I realized this is kind of pointless. I get attached to these things. I don't need. I didn't. I never knew, and I still don't know how to. When someone else writes it, how to? How do I tell him to make it better? They just woof. Where do I start? It's just I don't really know how to guide by words. I just know how to jump in and, and write it. I can comment and like. So I. So we never never did a lot of that. And we, we had all the offers of the Marvel movies and stuff like that, and I, I didn't feel like that was for me at the time. And I, I, most of anything, I felt like this will kill me because it, I, I can be arrogant to think that I'm ready, but I'm going to go there and, and I might fail because I'm not ready. I, I was ready enough to make Evil Dead, but I, was not, I didn't feel I was ready for that. So I said no, and then it's just like the beginning, probably a year later maybe, people wouldn't remember who I was again, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was like, ah, we were left to our own devices, and Rola and I thought we should do something, what we're going to do, and, and we're facing the white page, and we thought about Don't Breed, and, yeah. and we started writing, and, but this time, mostly out of a political impulse more than anything, we were like, we not, because Evil Dead, we made it, I wrote it, directed it, we, there was, you know, I had an executive there, it was a good friend of mine, J.R. Young, was with me there, but we really make the movie ourselves, right? And then, and then the movie came out, it was number one movie in America, we made no money out of the movie. And, and we, for us, it wasn't the greed, it was just a, out of principle. <laughs> Uruguay is very socialist, I don't know if you know, but we are a very, very deeply socialist country, so everything they taught me was like, that's not right if I write it. And so Don't Breed, we wrote it, we spec it, we control it, we own it. And then when we went out to do it, we didn't, everybody was like, you have a spec, go sell it around town. And we said, no, I have a friend, Sam Raimi, give me a career. I'm just going to go to him and ask him if he wants to do it. I was like, yeah, but you need the leverage. You have other people against it. I'm not going to put Sam against other people who want to buy it. Yeah. I have to give it to him. And so we went to Sam. Sam said, like, I love it. I want to make a movie with you. Let's do it. And, and this time we were producers, and Rhoda and I, Rhoda and I owned the majority of the movie. Uh, we we fought to to do it that way to really be our thing, and uh, yeah, we did 2016, and we thought it was gonna be a small, obscure. It was a very dark script. The movie's dark the script was even darker, and but then came out and worked even better than Evil Dead. So it was like for me, it was a big lesson of doing exactly what everybody's saying you shouldn't be doing. And, and well, that's always it was the a, thing. A lot of pride. I mean. Uh I think that's the the main. I want to I want to contextualize this just a second because uh, there was a huge drought of filmmakers in your country for decades, right? I mean, there was simply no 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 national cinema. Am I correct? Yeah, if you compare with Argentina, for instance, Argentina has, has a history of cinema from the fifties and on. Uruguay never had that. It, there's a few obscure cases of a, a, one movie was made in 62, you know, another movie was made in that, but now, so I grew up with that idea that that wasn't a thing. Then in the, in the 90s, we did have a, a couple of directors that did, that suddenly found some success in the, in the independent El, area. El Dirigible. El Dirigible, well, that, that was kind of the first that I know you were involved. Yeah. Like, that was the first one that for me was like, what, you can actually make a movie here? Because that yeah. was a big movie, right? I, th that movie, when my partner, producer partner, Berta Navarro, uh, she said, we need to help this guy, Pablo Dota, who's making the first movie in so many decades called El Dirigible. And I helped uh, Berta pro help produce it. 
but we supported it and it became, what it does is it opens the possibility of making something different. This, and when you're young, that's all you need. All you need is to see somebody cross a door that was closed to try to get in, you know? And I think uh, one of the things that we have in common and uh, I like very much is the fact that very naturally you have, as have I, as have I done, I've done too, is you, you have appropriated a genre uh, and a technical prowess and, and the tools that normally for many decades were close to Latin American filmmakers. Because th there's a thing that is a very goodwill marginalization that happens within the community where you can only do this type of story and only this type of genre because you are Latin. And, you, and, and that is not constructive. That is actually self-mutilation uh, is what it is. And I, and I find it really beautiful that of course you knew the tools like I did knew the tools. I technically was form and effects and all that. But the fact that you are now really successful and good at a genre that was not normally that, we have to understand, and I wonder if you feel it, I feel it because I produce a lot of first time directors. I feel that we cannot avoid historically feeling the responsibility that we're not a single person, that we are holding the door for a multitude of people. And that's our responsibility. Do you feel that? I do. I mean, I, I tend to, you know, like Andy Muschietti is a good friend of ours. Like I work with uh, most of it, Pedro Lucas, who is right there. He shot my cinematographer, Don't Breed, and, 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 and Spiderweb. Like we, uh, in the last movie, Pedro Kuhn was busy working with Bayona. So I got uh, Galo Olivares from Mexico as my DP. And the, the, my my community around us making it's it's it, it, everybody speaks Spanish on my on my sets. Right. Not everybody. There's a lot of Spanish, except the assistant director who goes out of his mind <laughs> trying to understand what why are we plotting. <laughs> but uh, usually that that that's the way I do it the most. It's just by I make sure that there's in every movie there's more Uruguayans than the previous one. Usually there's involved in in many ways. I send a lot of VFX back home. To to friend that has a house there of effects when no one's did that we we really try, I I I gotta say I make it more about the Uruguayan than the Latin American. Yeah, yeah of course. In a way. But the, the first rule of representation is don't fuck it up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the first rule of representation, <laughs> yeah. and 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 whatever needs to be sacrificed for that, you you have to do it. Meaning you can have all the well-meaning intentions and everybody comes from your hometown or the, and the movie is a failure, you fucked up. Yeah, and, and you bad. close up the door to thousands of people. The, the, the fact that you have done successful movies is the first rule of representation. And I, and I do think it's very important that uh, even if you were not hiring as much, you are already... <laughs> <laughs> doing the first rule of representation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about what you're doing now with Alien. Where are you in that? We, we, uh, I finished the director's cut uh, a week ago, and uh, I had to go through the uh, incredible tense process of, uh, you know, obviously send it to, to Ridley. And Ridley who? My, uh, Ridley Scott, <laughs> who's my producer. Ridley Perrot, Gonzalez? He's my only, uh, <laughs> you know, he's the producer, the producer of the movie, and, and uh, so I, I sent it to him, and I wanted to see it before anybody, and uh, uh, and then, and everybody uh, gave me the heads up, Ridley is really tough. It's really tough. He's really tough, on the, and particularly if he has something to do with his movies. He was really tough on Blade Runner, which I saw as a masterpiece, and he was like, ah, he had a lot of issues with it, because it's really hard for him because it's his work, right? So, so I was, uh, even last time I had seen me before I went to see the movie, I asked him about the new Top Gun. I was like, what about Top Gun? Eh? And he's like, ah. Uh. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? And he was like, my brother's was original. This is like, eh. But, but he, he really respected, right? But you could see how tough he was. Like, he really looked at the thing. So I was like, there's no way I win this one. So, but, but, uh, and even he, if he didn't ask for it, I was like, I'm going to go there and I want to, and I need to sit on a table and look at him and, he, and get it. 
even if he was going to say, you destroy my legacy, I wanted to be in front of him and see him in the eye. I didn't want to get an email where he was like, Ridley said, you know, I want to, I was like, I'm going to go there and I want to see him. If you, if you will see me, I want to talk with him right after. And, and I drove there, I went there, went in a room, put a paper. I see his executives, which couldn't see him with him because Ridley wanted to watch on his own because he was alien. It was very important to him. He didn't want to have anybody in the room. That makes me even more terrified while I'm waiting. But it's also better. But it's also better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, and then uh, well, <laughs> and then he walks into the room and he did say, "Fede, what can I say? It's fucking great." And for me, it was like, oh, it was. If I, my family knows it, it was. It's one of the best moments of my life to have a master like him, which I admired so much. To even watch a movie I made, that's granted, but particularly with something like this, that he he will recognize it and 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 talk to me an hour about everything he liked about it. When it, we're talking about the Latin experience, I think one of my the best compliments he said was like, "The dialogue is great. You're the writer." Yeah. <laughs> it was like, "Yes, yes, it's really good." And I was like, "And because that's one of the things at the beginning. If I go back to Evil Dead, that was the thing that most people go like, "Can he write American? That, that, that can he write me. American characters?" That that's happened the to me first thing. for 20 years or more. That happened to me for 20 years or more. Uh, I remember a meeting I had with one of the heads of Disney. And after we spoke for about 60 minutes and, uh, you know, I had written already 12, 15 screenplays. Huh? He said, no offense, uh, who's going to write the screenplay? I said, myself. I said, no offense, but how's your English? I said, better than yours. <laughs> you know? And, and it's, so, it's so incredible. Uh, my, one of my agents, who was my agent for a long time, when I went to do Devil's Back, when he said, it must feel good to go back to your country, I go, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I'm going to Spain. He says, isn't Spain close to Mexico? <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think that's, uh, uh, one, that's a moment that is really interesting for me to ask you because I went through it a couple of times. And that is uh, when you achieve some success of any manner of success, uh, you have to make sure that you don't need it. And I, I did that myself. I disciplined myself to, to, after Mimic, which was extremely hard, to go back to do a movie in Spanish with Devil's Backbone. And, and Blade tried to make me wait. They said, no, 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 do Blade first. We'll pay money to the producers in Spain and you then do. And I said, no, that's not the order I wanted to happen. I want the reverse. You want me, you wait for me. And, and, and they did, they did, fortunately, because I was broke. <laughs> I was muy machito, but no money. <laughs> and, and then with Pan's Labyrinth, which was a movie nobody, nobody on my team wanted to do. And I, and I want to ask you, is there something in your map of the near future that is going to return you to, even if it's not in Uruguay, to your to your mother's language. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm always I'm always trying I'm always trying to do that. I'm always trying to find what is the moment. It's now I, I gotta go and 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 and, uh, and we do spend a lot of time in Uruguay every year. All our families there, and we go all the time. But yeah, it's 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 kind of my my white whale a little bit. But it's like, what is the project? What is what is the thing that I have to go? And you you are the big inspiration for me when it comes to that because I've seen you doing it, and and you made me believe that it's doable. That when you were already making this movie here, you were like, wait a second, I gotta go and do this. And uh, Ben's Labyrinth, all my family, obviously, like a lot of us in Uruguay from Spain, and all my family from Asturias, and and to watch that movie, it's like, wow, I should, that's something that. And I was just, it was just, it was just, just watching a movie called The Beasts. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. It's incredible. I was like, oh, boy, I gotta go back to Uruguay and and do my version of that. So I'm, I'm trying to find the moment where I, where the inspiration, I can help, but I have to allow myself to do it as well. You know, that's the hardest part, I think, to allow myself to go there, and and face the how tough. That would be for Pedro and I. But Pedro just did it when he, with 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 uh, Wayona's movie they shot in Uruguay because the story about the Uruguayans that fell in the Andes. So, but uh, and I was so great curious movie about by it. the way, great movie. <laughs> so so we so I'm always uh, imagine how that's gonna be, the be there and and there to lead a Uruguayan crew again and we we all that expect. I mean I'm sure, but I definitely want to do that. It's curious because the same question I ask, I mean, I produced uh, Bayona's first movie and we've been friends since then. 
And that was my question, when are you going to go back? It's not that it's an obligation, it's that it nurtures you in a different way. Yeah. You know, I think that, uh, again, if you start needing success, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah. You know, in the way people understand it, and that's uh, important for the community to understand that the first thing we have is uh, we need to preserve who we are. I think that you have achieved what you have achieved because it's you. I'm sure you're recognizable from when you were a kid in terms of what you wanted to do. Because you're not only for your first short, yeah. which had already those elements, but tell me a little bit about, about you as a kid. Uh, what, uh, what, were you, what were you watching? What was your inspiration? Why did you want to direct? I, I was lucky. My, my dad was a cinephile and really an expert. And, and he really, talked to you. Yeah, yeah. So he, he just, well, he, he, really, he really put it in me. I, I, saw, the, I saw the passion of, of, uh, of film, of what a, the love that it caused in him. Where he wasn't really a happy man in other areas. That made him really happy. But he, we had a, he had a, this beautiful collection of VHSs uh, of stuff recorded from television. So, and, and I had two particular VHSs that I would just rewatch all the time. And I always said, that's my master class in, in filmmaking. How, how many siblings? How yeah. many siblings? Two siblings. I have an older brother and I have a younger brother um, uh, who's also a filmmaker. Just make his first movie in Spain, actually. I, and I you were so. close to your dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were all, yeah, we were all aware. He passed away like five years ago, my dad. Uh, and it was, it has been, it's always been, yeah, because you, when you have a dad like that, uh, you make the movies to make sure he likes them, right? <laughs> like, that's, and so and I remember when he died, I was like, who am I going to try to impress now that he's gone? And he was already, you know, happy and impressed with the movies, but really, it's a, there's always some sort of dysfunction that I, that I think a lot of directors we have that he, even though we already accomplished this, the success has nothing to do with, the audience sometimes is whatever is my idea of who who would see this and love it, right? It's really through that connection, you know. And, uh, and when my dad, we share a lot of I mean, that. That VHS, we had, it had Moby Dick, it had um, Scaramouche, which is one of my favorite movies, as Stuart Granger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Stuart Granger, Scaramouche, and Janet Lee. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's, it's Hollywood at its best in that time for me, at least. Of uh, it's, so everything I really learned, and a lot of uh, Charlie Chaplin. It was, it was just, I just come back from school and watch the same movie every day. I just, my, I just got my, you know, afternoon breakfast, watch the VHS. And was watch that Argentinian movies. cinema was any, any, had any weight? Uh, there was some, the no, not really. I mean, it was some in Uruguay, I guess. I've never been a fan. I've never been attracted Arifarai, to the Argentinian no. thing. No, no. There was, as influences go, I tell you, there was, there's a, there's one, uh, uh, there's one Uruguayan director, um, that at the time, uh, I'm going to blank his name now, but um, Pedro Plenilunia. Ricardo Islas. Ricardo Islas was a guy from a small town in Uruguay that made Star Making Genre stuff in Uruguay, and made a, a werewolf movie huh. that is with no budget whatsoever, right? But, but, but that sort of stuff influenced me a lot more, mostly because I believe, oh, that this is doable. You can actually do this, and this guy, somehow he did it. And, and it wasn't great, which was even better, because it made me feel, I can do better, you know? But sometimes, at the great cinema, which that's why a lot of times the stuff that inspired wasn't that great, because a great cinema, and when I watch a great movie, even today, it cripples me sometimes. It scares me so much that I go, how can I top that? How so, so, so you watch a big movie and it paralyzes you? When I, when I watch a really, really good movie, it scares me a lot sometimes. It's just, I'm, I'm terrified of, of an account. I want to encounter them all the time. I'm looking for them all the time. And when I do, I, I have palpitations. I'm scared. No exceptions. I mean, like, because I think there are movies, there are filmmakers that when you go, they demand of you, and there are filmmakers that you come in and they serve you a banquet, yes. and and you almost get replenished. As it happened to you that the opposite that a great movie you go and say it depends I, on the kind of movie. Yeah, mm -hmm. like like I would say, yeah, I would say movies like maybe Blade Runner will will intimidate me in, in some craft level above all that I'm like, oh, God damn it. Uh, but then, then a movie like The Beast that I saw the other day, which is, is not a virtuous movie, at least at first glance, 
I look at the storytelling, I'm like, wow, it's so inspiring that you can actually do that. And, and, and particularly the movie like I find in video games these days today, they dare to do twists and turns in the story that no one else dared dare to do, like to kill the important character in the middle, like to really abandon completely the storyline and really move on to something else. And like, cause things that we consider the rules are the big no-nos, right? And they suddenly do the things, those really, those things inspire me to see someone being reckless with the rules and up the screen that that's what usually inspire me that because that's what i thrive to do in my movies evil dead had a lot of don't breathe had a lot of like really gonna do this stuff yeah we're doing it and we really and that, right. that's what gets me excited usually if my story has a place to do something that when you see it in the audience goes like i was supposed to be is this okay right it's okay let's watch <laughs> to have that moment of, of uh, that connects us all and feels like we're moving so, that we suddenly in some sort of uncharted water that's what really excites me so when i when i see it happening that excites me more when i see virtuosism it, cr it cripples me a little bit it is very very curious you say that because i do i do see in your movies uh one of the qualities that i like in filmmakers which is disobedience <laughs> I like disobedience. I think it's, so the obedience is shit. And I, I, I really think that one of the things we bring, uh, w when people ask me, what is Mexican about your movies? I say me. Because I, I would, yeah. all, all, all my decisions are the decisions nobody yeah. in the first world would come up with. None of them. <laughs> like I do, I do all the don'ts that they fear. I want them. And I feel that in your movies, that the the will, the 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 greed to be transgressive in a good way, like to to break those things. So uh, is is that something that, that when you watched movies as a kid uh, in the genre, you wanted to be in that genre? Do you wanted it always to be that, or you wanted to be in drama, or uh, how the, did you did you come here by design? Or did you come here by accident? I think it's a bit of, there's a bit of both. Uh, I, I think there was a, what I realized that I need when I make them, I, when I discover horror in my teens, and I was coming from this like more classical Hollywood that my dad was teaching me in a way, just by watching all those movies. And then suddenly I remember Evil Dead is one of the first ones that I see and I felt like I was, I, as if I was, was watching Talk porn. about a disobedient movie. It totally, and I didn't see any of the campiness. And I was like, well, I always make my Evil Dead is pretty straight, it's with a straight face, right? Because and people were like, oh, Evil Dead is supposed to be a comedy. I'm like, I, don't, I didn't see a comedy when I was 12 years old and saw that movie. I was terrified to my core. And, and, and there was so many elements there, like your family and friends turned against you. There was, in the way it was done, it was, it was everything that, that I've never seen before and the other stuff. And, and having, you know, a Christian background at home and all that, it was this kind of completely forbidden fruit of like, this, and then I couldn't raised, stop. You were watching. raised Catholic? Yeah, yeah. Very to, Catholic? I went to a Catholic school with nuns. Yeah, but uh, uh, Uruguayan Catholic? Uruguayan Catholic, it's very, Uruguayan Catholic is not very hardcore, I would say. No? It, it, it is a very Catholic country in general, you know. But, but Mexican it, but, Catholic is fucked up. No, no, you, you do, no. We're hardcore. very mild. We're mild. You're you're spicy, uh, 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 Christian. <laughs> we're, we're 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 not that. But my mom is still is, and and my dad was more philosopher of religion than anything else. What did your dad do for a living? He was he was uh, he he actually taught at the school when I went to university of communication school. He was the chairman of the film uh, option there. So he, he was he, he just loved film. He wanted to be a director himself. He never really got to make a movie, but. He, that's what he wanted to do, and and, and from Uruguay, he he held all of that at that time of Uruguay. He was uh, he was at the time running. He started the film commission in Uruguay in in the mid nineties. That 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 still goes till today. That makes most gets all the movies made. Helped Uruguay get in Iber Media when that happened. So he was very activist on on the on that world. He never really, but it, it was always you know it, it was cinema over there is always about sh make a movie that show you culture, and and I was like. I don't do any of that. I, I make genre stuff that yeah. that that tries to that that tries to be as universal as possible. So it's not really. I wasn't thinking in anything like that. So I, so I don't think I would have ever had a chance. Uh, maybe now I don't know. But in Uruguay, if the stuff that I want to do was. I don't think it would have never got made. Maybe a venture. Who knows? But, but I think the, cinema cinema is a country. Yeah. And it belongs to the whole world. 
Yeah, and yeah. Uh, now I mean, we change a lot. Now, now there's genre and there's other things that is not just the 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 mundane, uh, you know, thing that shows what what is to be a grandma living in a corner and the one goes to see her, and you know, like sort of like independent world Latin American cinema that felt like. It, like I was joking at the time when he's like, no, but the point is that you make genre and I was telling the other filmmakers that were making movies at the time and you guys like, no, you guys make genre because genre means like a style that repeats this formula. And I was like, well, there, there is you are the genre. establishment. Yeah. It's me by wanting to do what no one does. I'm not the establishment. I'm not making genre stuff. That, that's the beauty of horror. Yeah. Horror redefines, I, I mean, horror, like some of the hardcore genres reinvent themselves with every generation because they reflect the generation. Yeah. Noir, horror, sci-fi reflect the moment they are living, they are alive. They never, even although you recognize it the way you recognize a tango, there's a difference between Piazzolla and Gardel, you know? Huge difference. And I think you, 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 you do that, you reinvent it and you return some of the savagery that that was going away in a, in a way with the, with both the movies with uh, with both the properties you did. We, we try, yeah. We, I think there's something again. That's a very Uruguayan thing. That Uruguay is kind of very anti-establishment, very punk rock, and in, in its way, um, doing things. And also, you gotta you gotta understand that we, I when uh, until 1986, Uruguay is in a dictatorship. Right. So my dad grew up there, and and when when that ended there, when I'm I'm eight years old. We grew up with this idea that don't try, you know, anything that's been an expression of yourself. You just don't don't waste your time because dictatorship can come back any now. At that time, you had a beard; they will arrest you. Yeah. Just and my dad was always in that world, being arrested, and like we all this way, like you know, like Pedro's family. Like we, that's the that's what we grew up with. So once that was over, our generation was born with this, like, fuck the authorities <laughs> and fuck the rules. And they, in, in, in a very aggressive, the Argentina this is, this has is a very what, similar what, thing. What year are we talking about? The what? What year? I mean, it, it finished in 1986. That's mm -hmm. when the, the dictatorship finishes in Uruguay. So, but, but our, our parents grew, grew up there. I was born in one, you know, since the day I was born until I was eight, we were, would live in a dictatorship. So there was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of repression. That's why cinema didn't really exist because it was going to be the first thing that the military <laughs> was not yeah. going to let you do, express anything. Else. So I, I think a lot of the anarchic approach and the wanted to make sure that it's not in line with what it got to be, I always feel that it's inherited through my my dad's generation and even the fact that we were born in, in, a, in a dictatorship and, and and we really clearly had something very um would despise that just any, but, any but, but and then then what's your why and about your movies you well you, you, you should you should see me in a meeting with the studios yeah. as soon as someone's like yeah fit it but we don't do that i'm like we do oh we're doing that yeah oh we're doing that yeah and i i'm very i've been completely reckless and, and but i think in a way which is funny at, at some point, I thought that was a bad thing, and 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 at, with time, I became friends with the, with those people that it was like you never say no to that guy, and those guys goes like they I admire that because that's at the end of the day what they want from a filmmaker to have a strong point of view and like this this is the movie I want. I, I think that's always what I think that in, they they might not they might look they, their faces might tell me they're mad at me because I'm being really I'm drawing the line here what I'm going to do or what I'm not going to do. I always go well then I'll walk away. It's fine. I don't need to make the movie again. And all that stuff, and and I feel that every time at the end, they're always happy that I was that way, that I did that, that I didn't yes. succumb to whatever they were pushing to. And I do, I do believe in the push and the back and forth. I think the best movies get made. With the, the more they tell forth. you you're wrong and you feel you're right, the more you should pursue it. Yeah. I mean, I I, I found that the things that people have told me not to do, and and I feel I have to, uh, are the things that end up being right because they don't know. Uh, the people with the money are in the ship looking back at the fucking port and the director is looking to the way to the horizon and they go oh we're moving away from home we're traveling motherfucker <laughs> we are we're, we're, you know but but and let me ask you let me ask you and i'm curious about it as a human being because uh it's no joke sam raimi is a great gardener <laughs> and and it's not and he loves to tend his garden and he can tell you for hours and he does fertilize with blood and bone, and 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 that's what he does. Sam Raimi, the human, uh, that is not to do with movies. What do you do when uh, not as a, a director? What do you do? 
What do you? Uh, I don't. We don't have the time. <laughs> but I do a lot of things. I. I no, but if I if I yeah, if, I, if I I'm do. coming to your birthday, what the yeah. fuck do I give you as a gift? <laughs> <laughs> I, I play a lot of instruments. I have a music room, I think. I play, I, I grew up, my, that's why I always said my mom gave me, I, I play classical piano since I was very, very, very young. So I, 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 I approach movies from a very F musical favorite, place. Favorite instrument? I think it's piano still. Piano, keyboards of a kind. I play guitar and other stuff. I have a lot of that. Um, I, I like to build things, anything that just, I went to Uruguay during the pandemic and I built a Hobbit house on, Uh -huh. That was that was my pandemic. I just took a bunch of bought of wood. It's just like in the movie. It's not don't imagine some like I went the whole thing just myself. Friends will go, I'll give you a hammer and get to work and anything that is like create an act of creation that there was nothing now and that it is there yeah. and there's some in particular there's some magic in it music has a lot of that there, there's nothing and there's three me and a couple of friends together and we start playing and then suddenly there's all this thing that's so incredible that that's my addiction it's just that 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 act of thing thing happening you know going from nothing to do something give me three three of your favorite music uh to listen to three That I change three, whatever. I change all the time, but uh, I don't know. Like music, like style. I mean, I'm, I have all my style. I have tango. I couldn't listen since my father had died. It's really hard for me to listen to tango because all it was tango? him. Yeah, uh, and I play in the in the in in piano a lot of classic. Uh, that that would be my strongest Argentinian uh, influence to your question. And Piazzolla like, for me. Piazzolla is... and 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 everything you know. But I'll play you know Goyeneche and all those classic songs that I grew up like here in, in the, those those singers I, that that I play a lot in the piano. So I have all that stuff. Then my my most American bone I would say is Tom Waits was someone that that I'd always been obsessed with I, because it's so cinematic in a way with such yes, a. Yeah. Cinematic music is one of those guys. I hope one day I, I can cast him on something <laughs> as an actor. But um, that that's my American side. And then I'm always in the. I'm very. I listen to all the jazz. But you know, we can go uh, hours. Your, your, jazz. your movies feel very much like a musician's movies, and they do have that. Uh, I, I I hate to be pejorative, but rhythm, and they flow. And these are two things that are very like one of the things that takes more than a decade, if you don't have it as a gift, as a director, is flow. It feels like a bunch of scenes yeah. that co-inhabit a piece of film, but if you flow and you have that, that's a very musical uh, god. So that, that exists there. Let me ask you, um, um, what is the part of the process that you hate the most? Filming. <laughs> Really? Oh, so, yeah, so writing you enjoy? Yeah, I learned to, yes. It's painful, but I enjoy it. I can sit down, I've learned to go through. Now that I've done it and I know that I can do it, I enjoy it more. When, when I was doing it the first time, knowing where am I going? I have no idea what am I even trying. That was more painful. As I go, I enjoy the process more. The writing, everything that it's like. I was some of my the guys from editorial are here, so they heard this joke the other day. But you know, I was someone from post production. I was like, love what you do there. That it, and it was like imagine. It was, I was saying why it's hard for me to shoot and why it's like ah, oh, it's a bit frustrating. And it was like imagine you're doing your job with your mouse and I'm and but you couldn't touch the mouse. But you have to do what you do. But you cannot touch the mouse. So you need to tell that guy to move the mouse. But he moves it just to the right. Oh, you want to move the mouse to the left? That's another guy. Mm. You want to go up, oh, that's another guy. And you want to click on it, ooh, you're gonna to have to convince that guy why he's motivated to click. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and then maybe it's because I'm, I'm a bit shy myself and I'm, I can be very social, but I'm a bit antisocial in many aspects. And so it's a, yeah, I mean, I guess by two, you know how it is. You, you deal with a massive thing. I'm, I'm not, power has never been something I look for. So I don't lost it like leading the charge, you know, uh, like some ones I really love like about film is leading the charge. Yeah, that's how he described it himself, like to love the most. I'm fine with that, but I'm more about like to make it happen. It's the thing. So, so I think it, it, right in and what I'm doing right now, like cut in when the time for the music, oh my God, you know, because it's, they're more intimate collaborations. And I'm learning on this one for the first time to really enjoy more the making by being closer to the actors as well, to, to be more intimate with them and, and really get in there and, and know them more. And it took me a while to, 
really understand the heart of the actor. It was a big mystery. It scared me a lot at the beginning. I, I knew the techniques because I, I, I learned, I'm a fast learner. You, I need to do whatever it needs to do. We live in a time that you can buy five books and read it. If you don't do it, it's out of laziness, but things, the information is out there, right? Just to learn it. So a lot of the things on Evil Dead, I learned and I read everything I didn't know, I learned it. But the actress is such a, a magical instrument that is not. Did you ever not, acted? Did you ever acted? But I did in my shorts and stuff, and it's my secret dream. <laughs> I saw you the other day on that episode of Barry. It was like, there's Guillermo. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it, but you should see Guillermo did a great job at Barry. And it was like, <laughs> it was, it was, it was like, wow, wow. But it's my secret dream is like to be cast, <laughs> to cast myself on something. All, all I, I demand of my directors is that my part requires me to be seated. <laughs> if you want me to walk, fuck it. I'm not doing it. But yeah, but it's it's been the it's been the but this part and this time I felt like I I I reached a place that that what made me what, enjoy what more. changed what changed. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I, I had to. I mean, I've stopped movies. I stopped making movies for a while uh, because my third movie it was not what I wanted. It just wasn't happy with that, the whole process. I was like, I'm just, I'm out. I'm not. I Why? Just, Why? If failure was a thing, I'm sure, like I, I knew nothing but success at that point with my, from the short, from Evil Dead, from Don't Breed, all I knew is I do something, I put it out there, well, it goes great, and I was riding that wave, and then suddenly I made my third movie, went out, and everyone goes like, I don't That's care. That's great. Yeah, That's well, fantastic. now I see it, it's great, it was yeah. the best experience, and it was such a learning experience for me, it's something I needed Because so also, much. a year later, they also forget you fucked up. <laughs> that's true. That's yeah, a, you know. That's the yeah. thing. None of the yeah. two things last. Well, and I learned to see it completely different. But most, more than anything, when I arrived, hopefully it's legal to say, but I just went to the jungle and and moved to the jungle for a week and and did ayahuasca for a few days <laughs> and was awoken from that and I saw a lot of things that I didn't before and I so and that I, changed that that changed. that changed me yeah. a lot that changed me particularly in that connection with the actors and understanding certain things about uh, about that it just really changed me it just, and it allowed me to go back and was like. To be, that's also dude, very I don't know Uruguayan. what it changed. Someone changed. I what? like that you did ayahuasca. That's very Uruguayan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, was, that's it, a great. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Every, say yeah. I highly recommend it. Everybody should do ayahuasca <laughs> after a failure. <laughs> Absolutely, and not everybody. Not everybody. Not everybody. Not Big disclaimer. <laughs> can't can't take responsibility for anyone. <laughs> no, but but I I like I like failure. I like it a lot, and I've had. That and you I, like it. You, you I, enjoy I, it. I, I, I do. I, I learn. Don't lie to me. No, I do. I mean, uh, at this moment and this age, I understand what it meant when it happened and how I needed it. I do. I do understand it. And I, I think it's very moving that it's always trying to tell you something. I don't think you could do what you're doing now if you hadn't failed on the third movie. That, that I really agree, don't yeah. think because you you renew the deal with with the craft and the universe and you feel the need to be really good again. And you, there's still mysteries to be had as a director. If you think you know everything, like what I like is we're like plumbers. The more tools we get, the better we can fix shit. But there's always new tools that you can learn. And acting, I, I, I would say uh, a lot of directors I know are actually afraid of actors. And they don't, they're, they're almost like lion tamers that are afraid of lions. And, and I think the wisdom uh, to that is you, you moved yourself out of, uh, from one place to another, either through ayahuasca or failure whatever it was, and you humbled yourself to enjoy a part of the process you were not doing. So that's fantastic. Were you, I always thought about it. I remember when I saw it the first time, because Federico Lupi, which is the lead, and on Cronos, he's like this legend in Argentina, the fucking legend. He's a Lawrence Olivier. Or yeah, exactly. And I, and I grew up, you know, seeing him as this like, oh my God. This, and, and then all of a sudden I see him on the floor, you know, bleeding, like being played licking, this monster. Licking the blood, and yeah. I was like, how does whoever this director is convince Federico Lupi to do that? How, can, yeah. I, I always I always say, one day I meet you, I was going to ask you how you convinced well, uh, Federico and how did you, were you not intimidated by him or no, who he was? He he... He, uh, for those of you that can see them, there's an amazing movie by Leonardo Fabio called El Romance de la Aniceto y la Jacinta, 
the romance of Aniceto and Jacinta, a fucking masterpiece, unknown mostly in America, and he is phenomenal. Then he did the Aristarine cycle, and I, when I watched the last days of the victim, where he does long passages in silence, I said, that's the guy, right? But how do you get to Federico Lupi? It's almost impossible. So he was shooting a movie in Mexico, and I called the director and I said, I'll do the makeup effects for free. I said, oh, really? Why? I said, I just want to do them. So I, I wrote no Kronos, agenda. I wrote Kronos, and I was part of the crew. So I came in with the screenplay, knocked on the door and said, they sent you the screenplay. They said to read it immediately. <laughs> who, who is they? I don't know, but actors, <laughs> actors like to work. So he read it and he said, um, who sent it? I said, oh, I, I did. <laughs> and, and I said, what did you think? And he said, it's a very mineral movie. And I said, well, mineral, it's not that bad. So we got the money, we got him, he did the movie. I could tell you many stories, but it's not the point today. But uh, he taught me a lot. He was a great teacher, a great master. Uh, like, for example, when he, we would be making a scene and I, he would say, what do you want me to do here? And I said, well, I wrote the part for you. You make a decision. And he said, no, no, no. To be absolutely free, you got to give me limits. And then in that, in that little corral, I can play but you give me limits, tell me, and fence me in, and then I'll run. And I thought that's an instruction there's, you don't forget. There's, there's a quote uh, I love that I, and what I realized, I think it was in my ayahuasca awakening. I had a moment there, it's a quote from Scaramouche, where Stuart Granger is trying to learn to fence because he's trying to avenge the death of his friend that was killed by-, by Great Mel, movie, by the way, Mel every Fer Sunday in Mexico. Maybe. Mel Ferrer is the best, you know. Uh, guy, the villain ever, and uh, so he's trying to be as good as he is, and he's trying to learn. And he, and, and the teacher says something about the sword that I ended up applying to my actors. He says like the sword is like a bird. It says like hold it too tight, you choke it, it's died. You hold it too loose, it flies away. And that and that 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 balance of the sword is something that I've been. It applies to actors. It applies to the whole. You should team. tell that to Ridley if you come into an impasse. <laughs> And their movie is like a bird. <laughs> <laughs> so you were like, thank you, know, you appreciate <laughs> How mysterious an Uruguayan this man is, you know? But, but, <laughs> but Federico is, uh, is, became, for me, one of the big mentors. And, and if you guys can see his movies, he was a phenomenal, uh, a guy very committed to the left, a great fighter and a great, great actor. Yeah. That was the incredible, incredible actor. But I always thought about that collaboration with you and him. How, because you were so young, and, and I was that to go and face that that, that guy. I was uh, eighty pounds younger. <laughs> 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 no, actually, Ron Perlman was uh, a, a lot more confrontative. I bet. And back back then in Kronos, when I <laughs> I said uh, we had the first scene, I I invited him to dinner. And I couldn't pay for the dinner very well, so I ordered only dessert, <laughs> and he ordered the dinner. But we, he said well, we were talking about the character, and he wanted to know why and why this, why that. So it was a very different. Federico was at, at the very European formation. So let me ask you, what part do you enjoy the most? The most, I, I think, it's probably it's uh, coming up with the story. You know, uh, Rodolfo, my co-writer, he's my friend since we're 12 years old, and. And that, and it, it was something that even before we start writing movies, we did together. We were just actually that's how we ended up making movies. Just by we'll walk on the beach and say like, you know, would it be great? What a movie about? It. Listen to this, a guy that blah blah blah, blah. and we'll go and I'll go like, yeah, but not that, that, and we'll go, yeah, right there, there you go. And that was the game. Never with the intention to actually make it. Never a, like, you know, we should write this. And so it did it without the process. Just a dream of, and we'll do it uh, during the whole summer. You know, we'll be having lunch and go like, you know what I thought about that character should be? What, the third one? And people go, are you guys out of your mind? What are you talking about? How old are you guys back then? What? How old were you? you but back then, we probably were like... 15, 16, when we started doing that more seriously, we were like 18, 19, 20, and, 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 and eventually what we ended up doing, in, you know, this professionally was because a producer that had made some music videos I had directed, he heard us doing that and, and said like, that's a real story what you guys are doing there. And we're like, nah, you 
just joking around. And and he he made us uh, write it as a short story and send it to uh, to this thing. And we did a master in screenwriting in in, in in Holland, and that's how we start taking it seriously a bit more. I've said like this is a thing, but that's still my my favorite process on on. On Evil Dead and on Alien, it's the same. Rodo and I, at some point, tried to get away. We have a house in the countryside in Uruguay. We, we just go there. I used to belong to my parents now because me and my wife. And we go there and we just wake up in the morning and sit there and do absolutely no progress for the whole day. <sighs> he sits his computer and I get frustrated. He's on whatever, like wasting time. And I'm start playing the piano, and he plays some instrument, and then I go for a walk, and then I come back, and then for maybe 20 minutes, suddenly, we're like, you know what, I think we're wrong this, we should try that, and he goes like, yeah. And you both and are still right. writing And that's now. how we write the whole story. It's a You're story right. that the story, the, when the, to come up with that thing that, that where we, we don't write a word down. We you just, just talk. We just dream about it and, and talk and about it. And you still work together. Yeah. To this day, and, yeah. and let me ask you. Yeah, he's a co-writer on, on in, Alien. Yeah. In terms of uh, in terms of your ear, well, like for uh, English language, uh, were you always bilingual? Do you read mostly in English? Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I got better when I, when I did that master in screenwriting, and then when I did Evil Dead, I had to really uh, do it. But I, I think um, you know, my, because of the dictatorship, I, we moved to Belgium in early '80s the last four years of the dictatorship. So I moved to Belgium. So I grew up speaking French with my older brother. And then we went back to Uruguay in 85. Everybody in Belgium is weird. Yeah. Which is great. It will be beautiful. Oh, weird they're, they're, if you meet a French mix. guy and he's weird, he's from Belgium. Yeah. But uh, Belgium gave me so much because the best. all those movies, they, they were not in cable. There was no cable in Uruguay, but there was cable in, in Belgium. And all those movies I was telling you about, they were all recorded from the, from the cable and, and, and Belgium and it was such a mix it's such a mixed bag of people and talk about like you know also radical uh, kind of anarchic people but uh, that's I grew up there so so I moved back to Uruguay when I was seven you know books favorite books books I've been I've been in my which I'm going to start and talk about Uruguay that's what I'm trying to do right now is like when I think dream about a story but like noir has always been has been my my first love when I got it. Same feeling a little bit of what I was saying when I saw horror for the first time, when I read Chandler for the first time. And I, I couldn't stop it. I had to read everything. And then it, I, I never, I, I had a hard time moving on to Hammett and the others. I was just like, I always been very Chandler purist. And when I moved to yeah. LA, actually the first thing I did was we a whole tour friends. of like, what, what house did Chandler live in? <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he lived everywhere. Yeah, yeah, well, I live in Los Feliz and he had a little house there where he, he used to live. Um, and I went all excited to see it, and then turned out they shot uh, Melrose Place uh -huh. <laughs> in that place. <laughs> so everybody was excited about that. I was like, people, Chandler is very popular, but it was all people I just wanted to see. Well, him, him, and his, him and his wife moved everywhere. Yeah, yeah. there's a everywhere. lot of houses. There's a map of like the yeah. how many houses with Chandler live. But that, yeah, that vibe of the forbidden, that was like, you go to a house, it's a rich man, he has a daughter, he's a beautiful, you know, daughter, it's, he, he, it's his most precious, precious thing in the world. He's like 15 and like, and the, just the, dressed in white. And, and then, you know, 20 pages later, you find her in some like, crack hole like drug with needles or floor and like was raped with someone in my mind was like what the hell is this how is this even possible like this way like the complete disconstruction of the world to show you what really is happening and what people are truly what people are capable of and all that that the noir has is is it's the kind of thing that i want to do i want to go to uruguay and, and go to the countryside and make yeah make uh a, a noir story there That's it's fun it, it would be fantastic to do so I hope so. Yeah, I think you to should. marry my because that that love started in Uruguay. It really started there. My obsession with with Chandler. I you know it's funny because when I started writing uh, uh, all, on, in all of my houses in every place I have with monsters or with family because I have houses where I live with monsters and I ha and houses where I live with my family. And in LA, and and everywhere I have an apartment or whatever I have a complete Borges, Juan Rulfo, and Hemingway. And what I used to do, if I wanted to write in English, I would read Hemingway, which is the father of all the prose of noir. Yeah. Basically, as post-Hemingway-esque rhythms. It was midnight when they uh, stopped the car, period. Yeah. And, and uh, Spanish is fluid. And Borges and Rulfo 
Rufo is very, very punching and, and Borges is very melodic. Do you, do you have anybody that returns you to language in Spanish in, in, that you read? Is there a writer in Spanish that you cherish? Mm, I've been, my father would, would constantly give me this books and, uh, and I, was, I took it for granted and I, was, I will have a pile of them there. And I, I've, been, I've been away from fiction and books since I started making movies here for some reason. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't, I can, once I started looking under the hood of storytelling, it was really hard for me to get into fiction and books. And, I, and most of the stuff I read these days, I'll go like, you know, movies about filmmakers or mm -hmm. movies about whatever, but not not a lot of fiction usually. Um, well, I'm fucking Marcus Aurelius meditation. I'm reading yes. now. Like, yeah, yeah, like well, a, yeah. I will get it's into a pretty good that, book. That is it's an amazing book. I, I feel like I discovered it too late in my life. Yeah. But um, the you read the Tao and that the fiction and itself, not so much. And, see, and when he died, one day I kind of found all the, a lot of those books of and, your and father. I felt the responsibility, the responsibility to get start reading it. and Borges. Was uh, was was you know and um, La Historia de Infamia, the mm -hmm. Spanish title. Like, yeah. was like History of Infamia. infamia. Yeah. I, that that was like wow. This is like, how come? Where was this all my life? It's like because it's incredible to hear those voices. And Borges is fucking genius, right? And it's so well written. But to, to read something that is original language that is intended to be that way, right? Instead of uh, you know just translation, I guess. Yes, it's. I mean. When I read uh, when I read the uh, Nabokov uh, doing classes of literature and he he doesn't like Don Quixote and I go, Mr. Nabokov, did you fucking read it in Russian? Because I have something to tell you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> read read <laughs> translation uh, is not uh, the book. No. Uh, it's the best you can do. It's not the best Cervantes can do, motherfucker. <laughs> you know. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask you. Um, if I was a genie that could wish, grant you any wish right now, and I would say to you, what is the movie that you want to do next that is the dream? Or do you have uh, the bucket list number one movie you would that, like that to is, do? It's, it's been, that question is my curse. <laughs> so for that, it's like a nightmare because it's, it is what I felt... In, in my delusion, I guess, but since since Evil Dead and, and, and particular Rift Evil Dead, the, the I, I felt like I could do anything. That I felt like and and the, and I haven't. I, I probably made I made four movies and I probably wrote five scripts. I haven't I haven't spent time doing. I'm not I'm not always like when I decide. Uh, okay, okay, we gotta do this. I write it and, and and we do it and it got made. I, I don't think I never been in a situation. Unfortunately, it's embarrassing to say, but on the, the I, you know I have the script that I'm trying to get made and, and no one. It's just I, I wish because those are the stories of all my favorite filmmakers. They have those stories. I haven't done that, which tells me I have played too safe, maybe in some level. But then I look at Don't Breathe. There's nothing safe about that movie in many, in many aspects. Uh, and and even Alien is. It's not them telling me which would be interested in making Alien. That was just me in a meeting. Casual goes like, "You guys, I know what you're gonna do with Alien, but you should do this." I, I'm, not because they were asking me either, and then just walk in. That stay in the air, and then eventually Fox knew that I had said that in a meeting. I was like, "What was that thing you said at Ridley Scott's company about?" And I said, "Well, this thing." And I was like, "Would you like to write it and direct it?" I was like, "Fucking absolutely yes." And and then we wrote it and delivered and we and we made it. So it, it's what's terrifying because I feel like I should do more. That's my curse. I have all my friends are like, oh, fit again saying he. I feel like I should have done a lot more things, but I, I don't. I, it's really about like I need to find something that I really truly love that I cannot help but go and make right. Otherwise, I always feel. Who needs another movie? And like what? what I, I try. That's a Uruguayan aspect as well. For bad, like you don't in Uruguay, you don't waste anything. There's no money where I grew up. And there's, so you know, there's a plastic white chair where it's joke. No one gonna throw it away. Like with you in America, you, yeah. everything throws away. You pick it up. Uh, yeah, you'll give it to someone. And you and you put it in the. Uh, you won't finish putting it on the sidewalk, the street. Someone will take it, right? Because everything has value into the. Even this thing here, I'm looking at it. This is a pretty fancy box. <laughs> If I take it, I, my mom is about to, is coming to visit today. If I take this box home and, and my mom sees that I'm going to throw it, she goes like, are you going to throw this box? 
It's pretty nice. You could use it for something. Put a flower there, like it's just something. Absolutely. And it, it, that's that's the Uruguayan uh, way that you don't waste. Yeah. So so the idea of risking going and spending ten, twenty, thirty million dollars in something that maybe don't people don't crucially need is really hard for me. No, I understand it. I mean, JJ um, Abrams and I went to Japan to buy model kits. And on the way there, in the tray, at the, in the airplane, they gave us these little cups with peanuts. And I said to him, don't throw yours. I'm going to keep it. And we, I use it to mix paint. And, everywhere I, and I keep the chopsticks from Chinese food to mix paint. I have tons of Chinese toothpicks. And, uh, and so I understand that. But what I, it's not that bad that you have to go through that. I mean, not having... Uh, movies, I mean, you, you're very much somebody that confronts a problem, and you, but you would never do a movie you don't want to do. No. Have you been offered things that you have turned down because it's not for you? I, I, that I didn't pursue. Like, I met on the last yeah. James Bond. I went and met. They, they called three directors. Barbara Brockles in my last movie. I said, you want to come and talk about James Bond? I would have died. I was like, James Bond is a dream, but I just came back from making a movie, and my wife will divorce me if I go away and now for a year or so. And I, I didn't have the, the mental... Yeah. There was just stuff like that. A lot of big movies like that that I felt... I didn't pursue, I was like, I cannot pursue this. I, I just, I'm not, I'm not there. I know when I, like Rhoda Michael Ray always said, like, I can tell you in the room right away when you got, you're going to pursue it or not. I can see it in your eyes. And I, and, and, and I take meetings of movies that I told myself I wanted to make, but I know deep down that I cannot, or sometimes I'm too afraid. I, I think movies like, I don't know, Bond or Batman, stuff like that, I met on, I always felt I was too afraid or, or too afraid to also like don't, I've been, yeah, you know, I'm sure you know with Tom Rothman. Tom Rothman, we, make, uh, we made a movie together, and Tom Tom said something. I told him at the very beginning when I met him. There's always quote me like something that he, he, he said. Like it's very rare that that happens. That that I told him at some point where he talked about maybe giving me some movie. I was like, I'm not ready to make that movie. I'm not ready, and and you're gonna hurt me by by making me make that movie because I've seen young directors making the first independent movie that when they're it's, great in Sandance and then you put them on the big machine, yeah. it doesn't matter how talented you are, it's gonna devour you and you're not gonna be, do your best work. Yeah. And you want them because they're cheaper, you know, and because yeah. they work for less and you want all that, but you, you know, it's like, don't do that to me, you're gonna hurt me, don't put it in front of me because and I might say it. So I said, like, give me time, I wanna do that movie. Like when I went to do Alien now, I was like, thank God this wasn't, show, that didn't show in front of me. Right the at the time, time yeah. when I when I mentioned that 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 meeting I had at Scott Free was right after Don't Breed and, and look how long it took to to come about, and and thank God they they didn't they didn't say you know what let's good I would have never be able to do make the movie that I made and have the collaboration yeah. that I had with the artists and really put you know put that vision on the screen like I did now yeah. with all the flaws I might have now it definitely would have been worse back then. And I would have feel like, what am I doing here? But this, that's just the, the truth of the capitalist uh, business that just put sometimes push you too hard, which I know is a luxury to have and a good problem to have. But right. there's different versions of that as well at, at, at small level when you start into just being pushed into the place that you're not ready, but the ego goes, yeah, let's do it. I'm ready. And then you go, fuck that. No, I, I agree with you. The shit that shines is the one you step on. Because it's shiny, and and you, and it's a complete delusion. I think that uh, when I say to the young directors, I say you when you're very young, you feel clearly that you would never sell out, but you will never know until they want to buy you. <laughs> yeah. And then if you don't sell out when they want to buy you, you will not sell out, and it's a very different feeling. And I think you're very wise. But, I, but I, I, you know what I realized also at time, in that exact quote, this is a, a thing I'm quoting a songwriter, but it's like, not, I realized at some point, what I sell is the fact that I cannot be bought. Exactly. But, but that's what I sell. <laughs> but yeah. I, so I still sell in some ways, like, in a, in a, and if I ride too high on the, no, but ah, then, but I'm not into I, I it, think, it's, it's also, there, you sell yourself you, a bit. That's what makes you hireable or trustable. Like, look, I, I think that is, is very different. And I understand how you're saying it and the irony of it, but it, it, it seems to come natural to you. I mean, I, I, really, I really think it seems to be 
essential to you being able to work. I cannot help it. I, I no. just there, there's Don't Breed and when Don't Breed came out and they wanted to do Don't Breed too, they were ready to everybody to just throw whatever we wanted. I didn't feel in me that I wanted. I, I just, you know, it's hard for me to go back to the same world after one. Uh, I wish I could, so maybe now I can, but at that point I was like, no, I need to go discover something else. And, and I realized yeah. there how little I care about whatever they could pay you or like give you. It was like, no, I just be, really be, can't. Be, because I think filming a movie is not a date, it's a marriage. Yeah. You, can, you can simulate companionship, but you cannot simulate passion. You know, you, at one point or another, the honeymoon comes but let and me ask you something. There's no simulation. You're a very passionate guy, and I see you as I when I hear you talk about movie, you're passionate. And and I was reading Marcus Aurelius. He says something beautiful about like you want to be, you know, f full of love but free of passions, yeah. because passion. And this is another thing I remember reading a long time ago when I was reading the, the Art of Love by Eric Fromm. Uh, uh, he says, passions come from the word passive. You're not in control. Whatever you do out of passion. You're passive. You have no saying on it, which is how I have, de have a, how I, in a way, how I help my career. But I have no saying it by just going through things that I cannot help to make, and by just abstain myself from anything that I just don't feel the passion for it. Is it that a good thing? I think. I, I mean, look, there are certainly there, there's a big caveat in this industry. In this industry. There are certain words that are horrible, right? We all agree content and pipeline should be fucking banned from the language. Because it's, 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 it's absolutely pu... I can't stop puking when I hear those. But the other one, there are two words. People that say we're very excited and they wouldn't know excited if it bit them up the ass. They, they've never fucking been excited in their fucking lives. And the other one is passion, ambition. All they are saying to you, you're a weirdo. We don't know how the fuck you do this, but we're going to hire you. When, when, when I see a poster that says, from the visionary director, I go, they don't know how to sell this fucking movie. <laughs> but it's, it's, for the people that like this thing, it, this is the kind of thing they're going to like. Oh, we're well, great. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I, I think that there are much more modest virtues, uh, tenacity, honesty, you know, sincerity. Like, to me, sincerity is a new punk. You know, we live in a culture of great insincerity. Everything is performative. Yeah. Uh, nice is a dictatorship. Either you're nice or we're going to fucking kill you. Yeah. Oh, great. You know, what time you go to dinner? I mean, it's like, it's, it's really an incredible, uh, difficult time to be yourself and, and, and to be unafraid. And I think being afraid is, comes only from knowing your core. And your core comes on only from your most intrinsic self. And that's, it's easier to be you, for you, than anything else. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and this is what I, when I talk to about where we are, I say we, we are not a group of filmmakers that want something from this industry. We are a group of filmmakers that want to give something to this fucking industry. We're going to give ourselves to that. And, and we, we don't do it to be famous or to be uh, this or to be that. We just want our voice to join the choir to make this symphony a little better. And we need to do it. We, the world needs it. We have something to bring to the banquet. And I do believe that uh, one, that's one of the things that I, uh, the reason I wanted to do this is because we, we celebrate, we must celebrate every time uh, one of us, no matter what the country, no matter what the uh, cultural process is, whatever our history is, we have to embrace it. And what you've done is incredibly embraceable. You know? I agree. This has been, I'm over here crying. I'm not oh. going to lie. Sorry. I'm over here crying. No, seriously, this has been so moving. Like getting to know both of you. Yeah, I think. Just as people. Yeah. And even though we want so much of your path too, we want to, I, 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 I want to ask you one thing before you go, but, but just the way that. Is it fashion advice? The, <laughs> Always carry a scarf. Yeah. 
<laughs> but no, the banter the between BGA. you, the, the authenticity <laughs> and the banter between both of you, like I couldn't believe how one hour we could go so deep with both oh, of you. Oh, we've done an hour already? It's been... It's oh. been the most fantastic time with both of you. Yeah, thank you. And I and I want to thank you for all the wisdom, right? I think we're all when you you talked about the film, asking Fede, like, what is this film that changed you? You know, we go to the movies, right? We're all here because we were affected. We became filmmakers because films and, and television affected us and we wanted to become storytellers. This day, this chat has yeah. has replenished oh, me. Oh, that's great. And that's I know great. it's replenished all of us. So thank you so much. Oh, you. So just one question before you go. What is your hobby? Because you asked him about oh. his hobbies, and I am just so curious what it is. Well, I draw, I paint, I sculpt, and on Sundays, uh, a few directors, uh, we get together and paint model kits uh, on Sunday. We, I bring cafe and conchas, uh -huh. and, and we paint uh, model kits. And I jokingly said that when I was young, somebody said, if you become a big director, you'll be surrounded by models. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, we're surrounded by t a T-Rex and a tank. And a, but, but I read very much. I read a lot. I watch two and a half to three movies a day. I, 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 and, I, and I always say, uh, nothing is a hobby. Everything is a joy. Like, I think life is such an unending banquet of good and bad, right? But it never ends. And, and uh, the reason why we can talk is because I think if a director needs to have a quality and you have to choose between talent and curiosity, I would choose curiosity. You know, it's the one thing that keeps you hungry. Guillermo, thank you so much. Thank you.